Good morning, everybody. My name is Nikki Kool. I'm Dutch and I'm based nearby Amsterdam. Um, already more than 30 years, I work in this amazing apparel industry with focus on brand, product and process development. Or in other words, I like to call it aligning identity, quality and creativity. At this moment, working with Willis Cotton, I call myself a brand and impact catalyst because we know now that every new product that we create needs to reach many more requirements than only customer satisfaction and good sales figures. And in this exciting period of change, designers and developers are called upon to not only design a great product, but directly th rethink the impact on our complete system. And that is what we are offering with Redis Cotton. We offer the entrance to a resistant change of the complete cotton value chain. Our system is based on a farm subscription model in which together with the brands, we actively contribute to the regeneration of our ecosystems and at the same time growing your organic cotton demand with special attention to the social aspect of tribal farmers. It's an holistic view. It is a easy entrance, but it is really uh, about taking responsibility for the complete value chain. Thank you. Brilliant. Thank you, Nikki. Now, if I go to the next one on the list, I should pick on you, Debbie. Ladies first. Debbie, please introduce yourself. And why did I want you on this panel? Yeah, thanks, Charles. Uh, good morning, everybody. Great to be with you. Um, so I'm Debbie Luffman. I'm the product director at Finisterre. I'm also a circular strategist and activist through my um, consultancy, Think Circular. So a bit about Finisterre. Uh, we're a UK-based clothing brand, um, an outdoor clothing brand based in deepest, darkest, beautiful Cornwall. We're also a B Corp certified uh, business. We're committed to being a positive impact business through disruptive product innovation, circularity and community engagement and empowerment. We take a truly considered approach to our sourcing, um, weighing up the impact, the inputs of our textile sourcing decisions uh, with ultimately really set on making the most valued and long lasting products. We're extremely textile first in our thinking. We like to tinker and develop our own materials to improve and evolve on what's been before. Uh, we like to create and unravel value chains. And we like to think of ourselves as a, as a small brand. Um, we like to sort of punch above our weight um, and think we have a, a role to play in prodding and poking the industry to move faster and smarter. Um, unlike most outdoor brands um, that will be attending uh, performance days, uh, more than half of our product mix comes from natural materials. This includes organic cotton, wool, linen, hemp, and Ulex natural rubber. So we've very much got a vested interest and responsibility to part, uh, to play in, in our part um, within the regenerative agriculture conversation. However, I'm pretty sure that Charles has invited me along today because unlike Patagonia, Finisterre have yet to make the switch to, re to regenerative agriculture. Um, and we'll, we'll, um, no doubt we will discuss this further um, today and look forward to it. Thank you. Debbie, unlike Patagonia, you won an ISPO Gold Award at the last ISPO. So you're still one up on them. So congratulations on that. If we go to the next person, Simon, thank you for joining us. Please remind us who you are and why I've asked you to come and help out on this panel. Sure, thanks, Charles. And firstly, also thanks to the team at Performance Days for organizing today and to you, Charles, for moderating. Obviously, it's a shame we can't all be together, um, but clearly it's a sensible decision to do that. And, and I hope that will make getting together next year even more special. So thanks to everybody and uh, also thanks to the panel here so uh, i'm simon whitmarsh knight and i lead the team at hd wool so we are uh, an advanced materials technology business that blends science and nature to create hd wool apparel insulation so this is performance insulation for outerwear which is natural renewable and helps to sequester carbon so um in terms of why you've hopefully asked us to join or myself to join the panel and, and represent our team back at HD World, Charles, really we have, we work directly with our growers, um, which amongst other things means 
were able to pay them a fair price for their wool, something we may talk about later on. And last year, we joined the Savory Institute as their first value chain partner, bringing land to market verified regenerative wool to global apparel brands and retailers. So really, um, to, to, to add to this panel, I hope, again, representing the team's experience on setting up value chains, establishing sort of third party verification systems and taking the story of wool, which, as we know, is the original sort of performance fiber downstream to brands and retailers and finally offering that full traceability back to consumers. Just in terms of traceability, though, Charles, you know, traceability for traceability's sake is pointless uh, unless it can lead to real change. And for us, that change is in helping farmers move towards regenerative agriculture practices. Thanks. Simon, great. Now, the last character I've invited onto the panel is actually a friend. And this person keeps me more grounded than anybody else. He has educated me more about the science of fibres than anyone that I've come across. But so he keeps my feet on the ground and he keeps sense. He's a proper Yorkshire man. So if I can say, Mark, welcome to the panel. Give us a bit more about what you do and what you're going to bring on to this panel, please. I thought he'd invited me along for my dashing good looks, Charles. You've just ruined that idea now. Hey? Um, I'm Mark Taylor. I am a researcher at the University of Leeds, where I, um, I teach sustainable fashion, along with some colleagues, to our undergraduate students. And sustainability has become a, a really big part of um, the teaching um, that, that we do with our undergraduates at the moment. Because as you, everybody here and everybody listening is probably aware, it's a, it's a really big thing um, in the, the global apparel market. I nearly said fashion, but obviously not everybody's into fashion. And yeah, so we're, we do research. We've, we've worked with uh, HD Wool in the past. Um, and what else can I say? I think I'm about there, Charles. Sorry. Mark, thank you. Now, I've actually assembled a couple of questions for this panel, and I'm going to read out all three questions because I want the panel to have a chance to think about them, but we'll go through one question at a time. But the point of this panel is that it's open for any of our audience to send questions in. Now, if you go to the page that hyperlinked you to this presentation, there might be a Slido chat bar on the right-hand side. If there's not, look underneath the image of us all and you will see a view more tab press that and the slido bar will appear at the bottom or you can go there on the left hand side through the navigation bar so the three questions which i'm going to pose to the panel and i want to listen to the answers first one um is regenerative agriculture just a buzzword can it really make a difference to the bad reputation that apparel already has. So I want to know a bit more about the substance. The second question is, if regenerative agriculture is that brilliant, why is there not more of a take up of it? Why aren't we all getting on board with it? And the third question is, what are the hurdles that you have already seen in allowing people to take up regenerative agricultural products and the way that it matches or mismatches with the brand's values. So the first question is about, is it a buzzword or is there something behind it? The second question is, if it is this brilliant, why haven't more people joined in? And the third question, and there's gonna be a really interesting difference of answers between the brand of Finisterre and the supplier of someone like Radis Cotton. And I want to, I don't want trade secrets revealed, but you can give me a very good indication about it. And the third question are, what hurdles have you already detected between the, the values that brands have and the potential that regenerative agriculture offers? So, Nikki, it would be rude not to start with you. Could I pose you the first question, which is regenerative agriculture is it a buzzword 
how is it really going to make a difference to the poor reputation that apparel has? Well, I think it's definitely not a buzzword. It might be used in this way sometimes. But um, looking back, since 1975, our sustainability agenda has been dominated with all the R's. Reduce, reuse, recycle. Words expressing a sentiment of guilt, guiding us to rethink our work and do things less bad. But this regenerative approach is a positive, actionable approach, which we can achieve much more as just reducing our footprint. Even the language of regeneration is aspirational. And that's what we have to do. We have to inspire people to do more good. What if we align our individual, corporate and planetary objectives with this kind of words and set our goals in we strive, we increase, we maximize, we are building together. Then we create a shift in the actions and, and really change. So to, to again, next to the reduce and reuse, we should focus on regenerate and restore. And with this positive, holistic and social view, I feel personally very strong that the apparel industry is and should be the absolute front runner in embracing this fundamental transformation of their complete supply chain. Combining this with brands communications force, we are really able to create a influencer industry and inspire many more to follow this route. So um, it's not a buzzword, it's a must. Nikki, that's absolutely great. I'm going to now throw it to the other side and go to Debbie. Debbie, you're a brand, you're known for your wonderful practice in using better materials. But as of right now, regenerative agricultural product is not part of your portfolio. So to challenge you with the question, is regenerative agriculture just a buzzword or can it actually make a difference to the actually poor reputation that apparel has? All yours, Debbie. Yeah, thanks, Charles. Um, yeah, so I mean, I think just to actually jump on the point, I think that Nikki raised there around guilt, and I think that is is absolutely where we're coming from here. So, the question itself is sort of posed from having a bad reputation, and I think I think the real problem we have here is it's, it's the wrong approach. So we're thinking marketing first. There, we're thinking what's a brand putting out, and and that's why you know we do get into the murky world of buzzwords. And that's the danger because we're trying to say that regenerative agriculture is as easy as recycled poly. Yes, yeah, so we say, oh, brand needs to make a switch. Unfortunately, it really is not that easy, as as both um, Simon and Nikki will know. Going from a you know a standard cotton or wool and trying to put in a regenerative process and approach is completely different. And I think therein sort of lies the problem for me and why the brands and consumers are confused because. You know, oh, do I want regenerative? Is that better? Is it better than cotton? Is it better than, than organic? Is it better than recycled polyester? Everyone's confused. And I think we're trying to simplify and boil down to just you know one word term, sustainable, fair trade, regenerative, whatever it may be. And I think there's just a real, real danger, actually, that we just, we're just jumping from one thing to another. I think regenerative agriculture absolutely is the right approach. I think I'd be crazy to say otherwise. Um, but I think it's just not, as, as, as we will no doubt talk about, it's not as simple as just going, OK, tomorrow, nominate a regenerative wool, please. I, I mean, if we have more time, I'll talk about that in the next question, I think. But yeah, it's just let's not simplify this. We all need to get on board. We need to collaborate, work together. Um, but it's not going to happen overnight. Debbie, that's fantastic. A few conversations on the head and I'm sure it's going to start off. So Simon, now on to you. I want to challenge you with that same question because we've had, mm. sorry to put the pressure on you, we've had two opening statements which are brilliant and have painted the field. Now you are a wool merchant, so you've been processing it. So you're in the middle, somewhere between what Nikki's doing, what Debbie's doing. So the question to you, regenerative agriculture, is it a buzzword or can it really make a difference? Thanks, Charles. If, if Joe's watching, I'm not sure he's going to be super happy with being called a wool merchant, but I know what you mean, so that's okay. Um, but uh, yeah, so for, firstly, just 
picking up on some things that both Nikki and, and Debbie just said there, Charles. I think, Nikki, I love this idea you mentioned there of the focus has been on doing less bad, and we really should think about doing more good. This is also something I you know, picked up from listening to Charles talk a few times, and I was reading a, a, a Vogue article actually last night, just thinking about getting ready for this morning. And it was an article from last year, and, and one of the, the interviewers was talking about, you know, less bad is no longer good enough. It just means you're not part of the problem. Um, and then she went on to say, but what about doing more good and being part of the solution, which I thought was a really interesting shift um, and something we're trying to do when we talk about planet positive clothing. So I agree with you on that one, Nikki. And, and Debbie, not, definitely not giving Finnish there a hard time here because... You know, obviously, we've had conversations around moving to regeneratively sourced or regenerative uh, agriculture sourced wool, Debbie, with you and the team. And um, you're right, it does take time. That's part of the challenge. You know, it takes a bit of time. Again, Charles, it's great you've got us all together because we want to do more together in industry to really, you know, accelerate things by working together and sharing knowledge. And to be fair to Debbie, I think part of the challenge, certainly within the UK currently, is the fairly limited supply of wool from regenerative agriculture sources. It's changing and growing, but for now, it's a, it's a fairly um, uh, constrained supply. But just very briefly, coming back to, sorry, coming back to your original question, Charles, you know, is, it a hot, is it a buzzword? I don't know about buzzword, it's certainly a hot topic. You know, when I Googled regenerative agriculture this morning, I quickly got 13.7 million results which just sort of highlights, I think, how interesting it is for the, for the industry in general. And um, of course, it's, it's one solution. It's not the only solution, Charles. I don't think any of us would pretend that. Um, you know, there are lots of other things to consider, um, not, not least of all sort of changing some mental models in the industry. Um, you know, for example, longevity and durability, again, is a, a topic I know you're, you're passionate about. Um, you know, somebody once said to me, you know, there's nothing more sustainable than a garment that lasts. And I think that's another sort of mental model and shift that the industry is looking at. But in terms of regenerative agriculture, our, our bet, if you like, is on savory and their ecological outcome verifications. Um, you know, these are sort of actual metrics and measurements rather than just a cert, sort of a certification and tick box. And looking at things like soil health and biodiversity and, and the ecosystem. And this, coming back to the question around making a big difference, this can have benefits beyond the textile industry. You know, when managed well, those systems can help things like um, addressing some of the major challenges around water, um, uh, food insecurity, et cetera, climate change. So I think if we can manage this as part of an overall system, there are, it does have impacts beyond just the textile industry and, 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 and the uh, issues that we have as an industry. Simon, great. Thank you for that. So you've now added a third perspective to it. Now, before I turn to Mark, Mark, you will pick up from his accent, is a dry, humid Yorkshireman. He has the ability to shoot down so many wonderful concepts which have been discussed because he runs the lab at the University of Leeds, which actually gets the results. But Mark has educated me more about textile chemistry and how it's actually making a difference on that side so mark you've heard the you've heard the question three times now regenerative agriculture do you think it is just a buzzword or do you think it can make a difference to apparel's poor reputation i think well not just apparel i think farming as a whole can benefit from adapting more regenerative techniques um, anybody who, who's, who lives in the UK or who, who is familiar with uh, what happens in the UK may recall that very recently we had a, a problem that gas prices rocketed. The, the two plants that make most of the UK's carbon dioxide for both the food and the fertiliser industry were closed down because of the cost of the gas. And all of a sudden, there's no fertiliser available in the UK for the farmers to plough into the ground to feed their plants. And the only reason they need to buy this fertilizer to plow into the ground to feed their plants is because they're not using regenerative techniques and they're not preserving soil health naturally. They're not rotating their crops. Um, and so their reliance on modern techniques resulted in a, in a major um, 
potential catastrophe, which the government averted by throwing loads of money at it. But, you know, a better solution would be if farmers were, were doing things in, in more considerate ways for their, 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 their land. Um, so, yeah, I actually I genuinely think it's not it's not a buzzword. And, you know, I could just repeat what everybody else has said, but there's not a lot of point. Um, and I just think that the, there are challenges and it comes to your next question. So I don't want to I don't want to jump ahead too much. I've got a lot more to say about that one in, in, in an odd way. Um, I think we have to be careful. It doesn't get treated as a buzzword because I think sometimes that that does happen to to. Well, I was about to say new movements, but as you said, Charles, regenerative agriculture is, is about doing it the way it's been done for thousands of years and undoing a hundred years worth of uh, um, modernization, which probably was 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 not the right way to go. In 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 all honesty, um, but there are some massive challenges, aren't there? to have been adopted and, and, and not being that buzzword. So, sort of eating into my answer to your next question, I don't have a lot more to say, I'm afraid. <laughs> Brilliant, Mark. Um, as, you, as everyone realising, everyone viewing this should realise, if Mark doesn't shoot it down in flames, I'd recommend to everyone, have another look at it. Mark is renowned for bringing sensibility. And if he cannot destroy it, then I think we should all have a more thorough look at it. But so I'm going to go on to the second question, a lot shorter this time, Nikki, which is literally, if regenerative agriculture is brilliant, why has there not been more of a take up in your opinion? And I should, I should answer that shortly. Um, well, I think um, because it is a, a different way of thinking. Um, at this moment, companies have their structure and organizational setup in which we created efficient workflows, but in siloed departments, strict timeframes, and transactional relationships with stakeholders. To become part of a regenerative agriculture system, we need to involve our organizations in a complete different process, including long-term commitments, long-term planning, and absolutely the will to, as Mark just said, unlearn uh, of our past, but really to learn, understand, and collaborate together. And a collaboration which is based, based on, on creating relationships again, and not only transactions. We need trust and values first. Uh, we need courage, because it is something we don't know yet. And yes, to say it very short and bluntly, a harvest um, is not planable. And uh, that risk we need to take into the whole uh, collaboration. And I think that's one Brilliant. Of the, the Thank you, Nick. Debbie, same question to you. If I remind you, if regenerative agriculture is this brilliant, why hasn't everyone embraced it already? Yeah, thanks, Charles. Um, yeah, I mean, to be slightly repetitive on my previous answer, I think it's because people are really fond of quick wins. Um, and I think we, we saw at COP so, so little interest and conversation around farming. Um, and what was there was very much around food. I think people are increasingly interested in lab-based textiles as the sort of cheap and shorter, faster kind of way out of this crisis. Um, and I'm not saying that there isn't a role for synthetics. I think there is a role for synthetics, but we think we can recycle ourselves out of this problem in a very blink of view. And I think agriculturally grown textiles are far more complex and harder to disrupt, as Nikki said. It's not a quick, a quick fix, um, but it, it's not to say that there isn't a place for, um, for regeneratively grown um, agriculturally a grown product but it's it's not a quick fix and the current system is quite frankly broken our our fashion outdoor clothing textile whatever you call it it is broken and that's what we need to address actually that systemic change it's not going to happen overnight but we do need to address it that's yeah i could go on but i better not so yeah the system is broken that's what we need to be looking at rather than looking at hangers and swatches that's really good, Debbie. You, you're, I'm sure you're revealing too much information to everybody, but thank you for sharing it. Simon, you're the poor person stuck in the middle. You've got the farmers supplying you on one hand and you've got the customers like Finisterre on the other hand. Why aren't you a millionaire? So if I ask you the question formally, if regenerative agriculture is that brilliant, why hasn't everyone embraced it? 
Yeah, thanks, Charles. Uh, but very, very briefly, I think, and these are you know my own personal viewpoints. I think there are probably three things that 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 I would see there um, as to why there hasn't been a big or, or faster take up. And the first one li links to Debbie's point around speed. You know, you know, and and um, the fact that these things take time. Regenerative agriculture uh, practices take time when done correctly. You know, working with land to market farmers have to you know submit their land to a baseline check and then see where they are next year and the year after so you can actually chart progress so if i'm being regenerative i can actually see it's not something i'm making up but i can actually see in the metrics of my land how i am doing against uh, against the uh, the standards and the, and the processes within that so one i think it does take time number two i think there of course there's an education part when it comes to consumers and i think you know this is where my boss joe has been very smart about things charles you know we 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 believe that maybe consumers don't really understand what regenerative agriculture is right now but in two or three years they probably will as they start to look for things that are actually giving back to the planet giving back to the ecosystem and pull those through the value chain so um, whilst they might not understand it now, in two or three years' time, we think that they will. And then the third thing, probably a bit more contentious, is I think part of this reason why there's not been a bigger take-up is there is too much confusion in the trade. Uh, there are too many industry bodies, too many standard certification. In my old life in synthetics, you know, we, we had a similar, we saw a similar progression as people rushed towards recycled and then GRS became the sort of, you know, the gold standard, if you like. Then there were quests, everyone's rushing to biodegradable and nobody has a clue, well, what is it? Is it biodegradable? By when? How much? And that was a bit of a wild west. And, and, and therefore, I think if we can uh, hopefully come together more as an industry, share more as an industry and have a unified approach to measuring regenerative agriculture, that will help. Simon, where I was jesting with you before this, HG Wooler, a company that I've had a close look at, and the thing which has struck me most is the amount of investment and preparation you've had to make to make sure the standards are being upheld. And it's the Savory Land to Market scheme, which has blown me away. I know Rodale do things, I know Indigo do things, but the Savory that you've chosen to be part of is the hardest part of you know, regenerative agriculture. So full respect, you're putting an awful lot of work in at this early stage to seed it. So hopefully it, it will it will benefit you in, in, in time to come. But Mark, can I have some logic please from Yorkshire? If regenerative agriculture is that brilliant, why haven't more people taken it up in your opinion? I'll have to try and decipher the, the, the scribble notes I made. Um, obviously, everybody's familiar with organic corn. It's um, I, I won't necessarily tell you all my viewpoints on organic corn, but it, it's very popular out there. Does anybody actually know how much of uh, global corn production is organic? It's less than one percent, and that's been around for years. And and there's there's lots of inertia there. So why is regenerative ag agriculture suffering from a, a a similar sort of inertia issue? Well, th there's lots of reasons. If you're a supplier um, and you're getting lots of pressure from your your customer, the, the, the you know either be, be the the outdoor slash fashion brand or be the um, the fibre buyer or whatever, they're, they're trying to drive your prices down. And a move to regenerative agriculture in the short term is probably going to re result in um, lower. Oh, what's that word? Um, lower volume of your product at a higher price. Um, and that doesn't work when everybody's trying to, you know, make as much product as they can at the lowest price possible. So it's going to require a rethink from, from brands and probably from the customer at, at, at the end, to be honest. Um, yeah, so I can't Brilliant. see, uh, do I just sign finish yet? <laughs> Mark, yes. on this point, um, <clears throat> Those are the first two questions. Before we go into the third question, can I point out to the audience that you can ask questions direct and you will get answers from four people who I think have a greater hold on the information 
chain passing through this market from the the different perspectives the the panel i've I'm well chuffed of being able to get all four of them and they all contribute a slightly different opinion, but I think there's a common theme going, going through the center of it. If you go to the Slido bar, if you can see your screen, it's on the right hand side. If it's not there, go to underneath the picture of where I am at the moment and there'll be a view more button you can press and it will open up or you can use the, uh, um, the menu on the left hand side of the screen but yeah to to that final question and nikki i'm going to task you yet again could you give such encompassing answers what hurdles are there between what regenerative agriculture offers and what the brands want so especially in terms of values where do you see the fall down between what regenerative agriculture is bringing to the conversation and what brands want to take away from the conversation? Where where are the discrepancies? Nikki, all yours. Um, well, I'm not sure if I can add that much more as Debbie just said, it's, it's in between the quick wins uh, about their beautiful sustainability reporting uh, and, and the real action um, and for real, action for real systemic change um yeah you need you need to invest first as well um and uh, what mark just said uh, concerning prices etc for me i feel that the csr marketing and product development really needs to sit in one room and and make a different approach to their whole concept um, because then they get an outcome which is so multiple positive. It's not only the margin and the time they're always looking at or the product quality, but then they really can uh, yeah, shout out loud that they do something for the greater good. Brilliant, Nikki. Thank you. Debbie, same question to you. What hurdles have you noticed as being between what regenerative agriculture is bringing to the conversation and what you as a brand want to take forward onto your customers because you're the one part of this equation where you have to see the people who are going to use it who are putting money into the system so where's the mismatch within the process debbie i think the current issue really is that regenerative um is not consumer facing and I think we sort of want it to be, but it's not, and, it, and it's lacking standardization. So we want to squeeze it through the kind of fair trade chocolate model so that it goes straight to the consumer, but it currently isn't. There's a huge amount of, of lack of understanding and storytelling before you get to that moment. So I want standardization as, as, a, as somebody who wants to source materials, but I'm keenly aware that it's very hard to standardize you know, use the same um, criteria uh, for, for standardising the cotton to to um, potatoes, you know, to wool. They're incredibly different geographically. They're incredibly different from, you know, for a myriad of different reasons. But we, we actually do need standardisation if we're going to be able to tell the story from farm through to consumer. It's a long way at the moment from farm to consumer. And I think that's just to put a positive spin on it. I think it is a hurdle and a challenge but I think it's the role and the opportunity for, for the right brand, brand, brands um, to jump on here and actually tell the story because it's so much more easy to romanticise, you know, a sheep or a cotton field and the people that, that are involved than it is, you know, polyester, let's be honest. So I think there is an opportunity, but it's storytelling and standardisation. I think that's the biggest hurdle for us to overcome. Great stuff. Simon, straight on to you. You know the question, where do you see the mismatch between what regenerative agriculture is bringing to the conversation, but what brands want to take out of it? Why is there a mismatch? What is it? Sure. Yeah, thanks, Charles. Again, echoing some of the points that Debbie and Nikki have said, I think firstly, for us, it's about being honest, Charles. You know, it's not a panacea. We have to help the brands understand where this uh, story and, and product could fit within their, their product range. So that's the first sort of a hurdle, I think, um, as you mentioned, Debbie, you know, um, really just helping them understand where does it fit? Where does it fit versus other things? Where could it be a, a you know, a good alternative? 
what are the benefits of, of that um, and just making sure everybody's really clear on, on where this could go versus something else. Um, and secondly, I think, again, it was mentioned but, um, earlier on, for us, this is part of the, the hurdle is, is you know, growing the supply chain within the UK. So we have to demonstrate to our growers that there is a market out there. There is, and it is, it is increasing. But we really want to partner with, you know, with brands and retailers to help pull through this story to farmers who, as we know, have a tough time anyway. Um, and if we can show them that by adopting regenerative agriculture practices, we can help them in many, in many different ways. That I think is, is another, uh, another challenge to overcome. So that's where we're really happy to be working with the likes of Finisterre and others, um, you know, brands and retailers with whom we can partner that can pull through the, the demand and help show to our growers that uh, this thing called regenerative agriculture will, uh, will give them some payback and hopefully some premium for their extra investment. Brilliant, Simon. Thank you. Um, now, Mark, finally to you. It's this values questions, values that regenerative agriculture offers, but what are the values that the brands or the users want to take away? Uh, I might answer a slightly different question um, in trying to answer that question, Charles. Um, in the, 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 the question you sort of preempted us with was what, are the hard, what hurdles are there in matching brands' value position? And I think brands have got to think really carefully about this this, this idea. Um, regenerative agriculture helps address some of the issues with the, the raw materials feeding into the products that the industry are making. Um, but if we're still making too much product, then it doesn't matter whether it's regenerative or, or, it, or it's, you know, it's exhaustible. We're still we're, we're going to be causing more damage than we need to in trying to make these products, and brands really need to think really hard about where they stand in terms of that. You know, obviously every brand wants to sell more stuff, but if every brand makes more stuff in the attempt to sell more stuff, that just means more stuff gets made and more damage gets done, and and then it all ends up in a warehouse in North Yorkshire somewhere on a big bonfire. If you're a very famous fashion brand, um, and obviously none of that's good for the environment or good for sustainability or good for us. Um, so the, you know, it, it's it's one part of that life cycle of a garment. It's a very important part of the life cycle of a garment. But we need to be thinking about making garments that last longer, that have emotional durability as well as physical durability. Ones that can be repaired, that can have other lives. These are all really important aspects, regardless of what material you use to make a product. Um, to make sure that these products have a longer life and, and people buy less of them, which I know is not what I should be talking about at a trade show that's aimed at industry and the trade, but you know, it's the truth of the matter. We need to be making garments that people keep for longer. Um, and then regenerative agriculture could be a really important part of, feed, of, the, of the feedstock for those products we're making. Um, but if we carry on making in the quantities we do, De Debbie's idea that everything could be more natural and we should reduce synthetics is impossible to achieve because, you know, cotton is already 30% of global fibre production. And uh, if you want to grow more cotton, you're going to have to grow less food, which means, you know, some of the 9 billion people on this planet might not get to eat properly. And I'm not sure clothes are so important. People should be starving. So, you know, we need to be looking at this massive whole picture of sustainability and everything that, and the damage that the industry is doing as a whole. And we need to be starting to address every aspect of it. And I just think this is it's a key starting point. I'm sorry for rambling and going off topic a little bit, but I felt it needed to be said. Sorry. Thank you. Look, what I'm taking from that last question is actually an undercurrent that some brands have values and some brands just sell product. And is that the massive gap? The brands with values are not having a problem with what regenerative agriculture is bringing to the conversation. But those that just want to maximize product sales or churn, they're not part of the conversation, which is a shame. But, you know, life will go forward. I now have a whole, there were more questions on this panel than both the previous panels put together, both the previous presentations put together. I now need to restrict us. We've only got five, possibly 10 minutes left. I'm going to read out every single question. Pick whichever one you want to answer. All right. So if I start with the questions, 
How are the yields of regenerative agriculture compared to harvest per acre of conventional production processes? First question. Second, what percentage of consumer apparel made out of natural fibres could be produced out of regenerative natural fibres today and in a best case for the future? Third question. Thank you, Frank. Do you see any serious challenge related to fake certification? How can it be avoided so as not to prompt the problem? Next question, Becky. So for the regenerative agriculture to become mainstream, we need to be producing less and more slowly, which seems to be key to so many of the issues of the industry. Chris then says, in which aspects does regenerative go further than organic agriculture? Gemma has come in and said, do you think the startup activewear brands should be focusing on recycled fibers as they are more accessible or, biode or biodegradable and regenerative alternative? So that's a, a, a triple solution sh she's recommending. And the last question I'm going to read out, otherwise we'll never get to them, is does regenerative agriculture differ depending on the country or the climate or the ecosystem and how can that be understood universally so i've read you a whole bunch of questions which of you wants to answer which one just stick up your hand and we'll go straight to you with whatever question you've got there nikki is that a hand i'm seeing up well a doubting hand but i think there's so many questions that i cannot answer just one specific as I wrote some notes and I answer all of them a little bit. Um, especially because I heard something about, shouldn't we focus more on recycling? And um, for me, it is incredibly important that if we do recycling, then we have the, the first input needs to be healthy and clean as well. And therefore regenerative agriculture is as well a very important issue. Next to the fact that um, the way we see regenerative agriculture is that it is not only about, for example, cotton, it is really a, a good mix of food and fibers. So we do have an enormous uh, positive impact uh, on soil, on nutrition, on what the farmer can sell out of it, even up to medicine, etc. It, it is a different approach. It's nothing to do with one mono crop. What is as well, uh, talking about certification, certification, you need, you need standardization, Debbie, what you said. But that is, of course, in regenerative agriculture, a little headache because every soil, every weather condition, every um, yeah, point on the world, it's different. So you have different things to to, Nikki, to that's really at. good to know, but I'm going to have to draw you <laughs> right. to a close because I want Mark to join in now. We've got a couple of minutes, so if you can restrict it to a minute answer, we'll love you, Mark. I'll try really best and try and talk as a typical fast Yorkshireman. Like Nikki, I made a few notes. Um, how are yields compared to conventional? Um, I think they're going to be lower. You've got to rotate your crops because you're preserving soil health. You've got to plant cover crops. Um, so I think we've got to accept that you're going to get lower yields. I might be wrong on that, but I think overall you will because intensively you just plant the same crop in the same field over and over again. Um, what percentage could be regenerative? Well, why can't it be 100%? Why can't every farmer adopt regenerative techniques? Right now it's going to be low, but in the future it, it could be. Do you see any um, challenge around certificates? Absolutely. Um, fake ones? Absolutely. How can we get around it? We need to... Uh, maybe look at blockchain and, and other, you know, maybe DNA type. Uh, I don't mean, I know it's in the DNA of the crop, but um, fashion DNA type stuff that's been investigated. Becky, the answer to your question is yes. Chris, um, why is it different to organic? Because it's it's not only about one crop, it's about the whole thing. It's, it goes beyond just how you grow in that, that cotton or whatever. In fact, regenerative agriculture doesn't require an organic crop. It could be done with a BCI crop or, or even a, a normal crop. Um, there are issues around organic certification that we don't have time for. Um, and I think I'll stop there, Charles. Thank you, Mark. Um, so I'm now on Simon. Do you want to add anything to, the, to this conversation that we've got going round? 
Are, did any of the questions make you think, yes, we should put some, some more information on the table? Definitely, but I think Debbie raised her hand electronically for earlier than I did, Charles. So you might want to ask Debbie first, then I'll, then I'll finish off if you like. Oh, Thank you, it. Simon. <laughs> Debbie, if we come to you, almost to wrap up everything that you've heard, what are you now thinking? Well, I mean, the two questions that I thought were most um, suitable for me really were around the producing um, more slowly and also the idea of startups. Um, so I want to talk to that just briefly. Um, so absolutely, and um, to echo what Mark said as well, uh, this is about um, reducing production and reducing consumption. And this is the fashion and outdoor industry trying not to pretend that we can either recycle ourselves, offset ourselves or consume ourselves out of the crisis that we're in. So we just need that awareness for a moment. Um, and I think startups are the absolute best people to do this. I wish I, I, you know, we were a startup again, because it's, it's actually easier because you've got much more of a roadmap. You, you start at the end because we're currently in a linear process. So to make it circular, you start at the end and you go, how can we make it last longer? How can we reduce that impact and keep all the waste in? So it's everything. Look at the RAP latest statistics around design for circularity, circular business models, circular materials. Startups need to look at everything, not biodegradable materials, regenerative agriculture, recycling. Look at the whole system and then work out what is best for their brand to make the most long lasting value products. Debbie, brilliant. Now I'm going to draw this to a close because it's we've actually gone beyond the time the panel should be running. But I want to highlight, we. Um, a question before I close, actually from Maria, which is what would be the best approach to be able to work with regenerative, regenerated material? Maria, the reason why I didn't ask that question is we're talking about regenerative agriculture. Regenerated material is actually something slightly different. That's almost a recycled material when we produce a material from one that has previously previously existed. This is the process to get the material in the first place. But if I could be so bold as to try and wrap up the whole of today's panel, I think you will now realise why I invited these four colleagues, friends, debaters, people who challenge the way of thinking, because they each have a very informed perspective. I think we have all become a lot more educated and also we can see the commonality, the thread running through the middle, which is the challenge point that we're at for regenerative agriculture as it approaches the tipping point. Now, all four of them and mine as well, I think our email addresses are on the website. They're all decent people, so they will answer emails if you send them to us or send them to info at performancedays.com. But thank you to the panel. You have provided so much wisdom that I should just shut up and not talk about this, but refer everything to you guys in future. Thank you for taking part. To the audience, I think this subject is going to come back at the next performance stage or functional fabric fair. We're just at the start of that wave and that wave has been growing in strength and more people want to find out more about this subject. So to everybody, thank you for taking part and please everyone wave.